Coming up on primetime news, rival political parties are on track to pass legislation on the future of the nation's public pension system following marathon negotiations. Anthrax in Korea. The Pentagon says live samples of the biological agent were accidentally sent to an American Air Force base here in South Korea. Military officials say 22 people may have been exposed. And Korean health authorities are under fire for allowing a suspected MERS patient to leave the country for China. This as the seventh case of the deadly virus is confirmed on the peninsula. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello and welcome to Primetime News on this Thursday, May 28th. I'm Paul Yi. And I'm Huang Jie. Thanks for joining us. We start off at the National Assembly where last-minute negotiations are underway on legislation to overhaul the public pension system, among other pressing issues. That's right. And we now connect to our National Assembly correspondent Park ji for more details. ji we're finally seeing a breakthrough on reforms for the debt-ridden civil servant pension plan. How did it play out? Hi guys, the two rebel parties finally agreed to pass a long sought pension reform bill at the full assembly session tonight, which is set to get underway soon. The agreement came during a floor leaders meeting between the two parties, which lasted for hours on this Thursday, focused on a number of issues linked to the public servant pension reform plan. And now it seems that it will finally pass through the assembly along with some other 50 pending bills. Jiwon, today's full assembly was originally scheduled at 2 p.m., but we're now heading closer towards midnight. There have been numerous talks up to this point, so what's delayed the afternoon session? Well, from the very start of today's discussions, the two parties were actually in agreement on the pension reforms, both the civil servant pension reforms and plans to strengthen the much larger national pension service for the general public after some eight hours of marathon talks on Wednesday. However, it was their differences over the Taewoo Ferry ordinances which have stalled talks up to this point. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy had demanded the inclusion of rules to implement the Taewoo Ferry special law as a package deal with those pension reforms. They argue that according to the party's May 10th agreement, the focus of the current extraordinary assembly session was to resolve pension issues and improve Taewoo Ferry ordinances. Bereaved families of the ferry victims and civic groups have raised concerns about the investigation committee's impartiality. And as for the opposition's request, the ruling Senate party said the Taewoo Ferry ordinances need further discussion by both parties' floor leaders. That issue aside, both parties are on agreement with the pension reform plans and share an understanding that the debt ridden system needs to be resolved as soon as possible. Well, this has been Park ji from the National Assembly. All right, ji thank you for that report. And staying at the National Assembly, preparations for the confirmation of Prime Minister nominee Hwang kyo wan are underway at the Parliament. Thirteen members of the special bipartisan committee in charge of his hearing were finalized today. The ruling Serenity Party selected seven lawmakers, including the committee's chairman. Of those, four have prosecutorial backgrounds, which is expected to play a key factor in evaluating the prosecutor turned justice minister. The main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, chose the remaining members. The National Assembly has to carry out hearings to vet Huang's candidacy and hold a final vote on his nomination by June 14th. And in other news, U.S. Forces Korea says scores of personnel may have been exposed to live samples of anthrax that were accidentally shipped by an American Army lab. So far, none of them have shown signs of infection. Our Kim Hyun bin breaks down what happened. Questions are bound to be asked about how a live sample of one of the deadliest diseases known to man was mistakenly sent from a U.S. military research facility in Utah to an American airbase in South Korea. The Pentagon said on Wednesday that live anthrax was sent to nine U.S. states and the Osan Air Force Base south of Seoul. A Pentagon official stressed that all the samples have since been destroyed in accordance with appropriate protocols. The U.S. Defense Department says there's no known risk to the general public and no personnel have shown any signs of possible exposure. 
It appears the samples were shipped from a proving ground in Utah on April 30th, then distributed to labs in nine states and Korea. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was alerted to the mix-up after a lab in Maryland discovered their package included live samples. It's thought the CDC notified Osan Air Base on Saturday. Live anthrax can cause severe illness and even death among people who come in contact with it, while dead anthrax samples can be used for research. A terrorist sent live samples of anthrax through the U.S. mail to government and media targets back in 2001, killing five people. Remember, I need that news. Health authorities have confirmed that two more cases of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in Korea bring the total number to seven, the biggest concentration of patients outside the Middle East region. And as our Han Doan explains, there might be new cause for alarm as a suspected MERS patient boarded a plane to China. The two latest patients diagnosed with the MERS virus both had close contact with the first patient. One, a 71-year-old man who shared the same hospital room as the first patient, and the other, a 28-year-old health professional who treated him. The Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says the two were under home quarantine since the confirmation of the first case last Wednesday, but developed symptoms overnight. However, the CDC is now facing a bigger problem. To the shock of many, authorities have confirmed that a suspected MERS patient left home quarantine and boarded a plane to China on Tuesday. He's the son of the third patient who was also secluded at home. According to Yonhap News Agency, he is in isolation at a large hospital in China undergoing diagnostic tests. The CDC is being grilled over its incompetence, especially for the loose monitoring of dozens of suspected patients. Some medical experts say the situation may get much worse. I expect several more MERS cases within the next few days, as many people were exposed to the first patient not knowing he carried the virus. Also, if some people were infected from the suspected patient who flew to China, there will be many more tertiary infections, and in that case, we're facing quite a serious situation. The center has isolated the suspected patient's wife, as well as 10 other medical staff who may have had contact with him. Officials are also going through the plane's passenger list. There are now 73 people in home quarantine. Han Dan, Arirang News. Now, those additional MERS cases have added to public fear, especially since many know very little about this relatively new disease to Korea. Our Kwan Sua gives us some background on this health threat. Korea now has the highest number of MERS infections outside the Middle East. The virus first appeared in Saudi Arabia three years ago and has since been reported in 22 other countries. More than 1,150 people have been infected with over 470 related deaths. It has a fatality rate of 40.7%. The virus is a member of the coronavirus family, which includes common colds as well as the deadly SARS or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. In 2013, the World Health Organization called MERS a, quote, threat to the entire world. With the impacts of the latest Ebola outbreak still lingering, fear is growing in Korea that MERS may spread. Some health officials say there is no need to raise alarm just yet, since the virus is not considered very contagious. Of the total cases reported worldwide, only 2.5 percent were from non-Middle Eastern countries. However, public criticism over the slow handling of these latest cases has pressured authorities to take extra caution to prevent future spread of the virus. MERS has an incubation period of 2 to 14 days. The most common symptoms are high fever, coughing and shortness of breath. According to the CDC, the best way to prevent catching the virus is to wash your hands regularly and avoid personal contact with infected or sick people, among other basic measures. There is no clear answer yet as to how MERS is being transmitted and no vaccine to prevent an infection only treatment to alleviate the symptoms. Kwon Soa, Arirang News.
The leaders of Korea and Uzbekistan held talks in Seoul today. In their second meeting in less than a year, they agreed to boost cooperation in various fields like energy and construction. Choi Yoo-sun reports. Uzbekistan, rich in natural resources and home to 30 million people, has one of the fastest growing economies in Central Asia. The Uzbek economy expanded by more than 8 percent last year, and the government there plans to invest 55 billion U.S. dollars into infrastructure development, including road and airport construction, over the next five years. In recent years, Korean companies have won more than a dozen of Uzbekistan's project orders, worth nearly $7 billion, and now they're vying for more. During their meeting Thursday, President Bakunhe and visiting Uzbek President Islam Karimov discussed increasing joint ventures. The two countries signed a $4.5 billion deal to work together on a plant that produces olefin, a material often used in construction from methanol in natural gas. President Bak also requested Tashkent's support for Korean participation in its solar energy plant construction as the two countries are currently working together in this field. The two countries will also lay the groundwork for a bilateral trade deal as Uzbekistan is Korea's biggest trading partner in Central Asia. Seoul and Tashkent also inked deals to expand cooperation in health care and ICT. In international matters, the Uzbek leader reaffirmed his support for President Bak's trust-building process with North Korea, her peace initiative in Northeast Asia, and the Eurasia Initiative for connecting energy and logistics infrastructure through the continent. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. And President Park Geun-hye also met with a delegation from a U.S. congressional committee today and reaffirmed Korea's strong alliance with the United States. The group, consisting of nine American lawmakers, said it supports Seoul's efforts for a peaceful reunification on the peninsula and President Park's upcoming trip to Washington. The president said the foundation for stronger ties were laid after the two countries had earlier reached an agreement on atomic energy, military cost sharing and the OPCON transfer. However, discussions on the possible deployment of the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, on Korean soil was not made. The committee had said the anti-missile battery would be mutually beneficial as it would protect Koreans and American forces from North Korean nuclear threats. And with the deadline for a nuclear deal between Tehran and six world powers fast approaching, an exiled Iranian opposition group has said that North Korea and Iran are continuing to exchange information on nuclear weapons technology. The National Council of Resistance of Iran, or NCRI, based in Paris, said Thursday that North Korea's defense ministry team visited Iran in April, their third trip this year. According to the group, a nine-member delegation is scheduled to return in June. The reports have not been verified, and analysts say the NCRI has its own agenda. However, in the past, the UN panel said that monitors North Korea has said the two countries regularly exchange technology on ballistic missiles technology, a violation of UN sanctions. Korea is moving up in the world in terms of global competitiveness. A new survey shows the country has made some economic gains. But as our Son Jong-in explains, there's still a lot of room to improve. Korea ranked 25th in terms of competitiveness among 61 economies surveyed this year, according to the Institute for Management Development based in Switzerland. That's one notch higher than last year and two spots above Japan. By category in economic performance, Korea jumped from 20th to 15th place on the back of gains in employment, domestic economic conditions and international trade. Despite current challenges, Korea had the lowest long-term unemployment rate among countries surveyed. However, the country's management activities, consumer prices, business-related laws and overall labor market conditions ranked low. The International Institute presented a set of tasks for Korea to focus on this year, managing household debt, creating quality jobs and improving inter-Korean relations, all ways to make the country more competitive. The United States maintained its top spot in the survey, followed by Hong Kong and Singapore. The G20 and BRIC countries saw their rankings drop overall due to slow economic recovery and growth. 
China climbed one notch to 22nd place, while Japan slipped six places to 27th. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And now a somewhat promising update on Japan's bid to list wartime industrial facilities as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The country may be willing to discuss possible compromises to resolve tensions with Asian neighbors. That's what the Japanese chief delegate told his Korean counterpart, according to an official at Seoul's foreign ministry Thursday. The two sides met last week in Tokyo as part of Korea's attempt to stop Japan's UNESCO bid on the grounds that nearly 60,000 Koreans were forced to work at several of the facilities during World War II. Japan had initially refuted Korea's opposition, saying politics should not affect the country's application. Another Korean victim of Japan's World War II sexual enslavement has passed away. According to an advocacy group for former sex slaves, Lee Ho Soon died at a hospital in Gyeongsang Namdo province on Wednesday evening. She was 91 years old. The number of known survivors now stands at 52 out of the total 228 registered Korean victims. However, historians estimate there were about 200,000 sex slaves from all over Asia, most of them believed to have been Korean. Seoul has been demanding Japan offer a sincere apology and compensation for the victims. So far, Japan has refused. This is as the average age of the Korean survivors is surpassing 88. And now a special memorial service dedicated to foreigners who've made a great sacrifice for Korea. Our Na Hong Kyung attended the ceremony Thursday and reports on an American soldier with unique connections to the country. Nothing stopped William Hamilton Shaw from answering the call to defend the country of his birth and childhood. The Shaws were missionaries and they were living in Pyongyang in 1922, the year he was born. When the Korean War broke out, Shaw was abroad, but he put an immediate halt to his studies at Harvard University and volunteered for the U.S. Navy. With his deep understanding of the local language and geography, he was a big help to General Douglas MacArthur's orchestration of the landings at Incheon. Shaw was killed in action while leading dangerous intelligence missions to recapture Seoul. He was just 28. Mr. Shaw is buried here at the Yangwajin Foreign Missionary Cemetery in Seoul. His gravestone is one of 417 set up at the cemetery, but he's the only person honored here for having fought and died in the Korean War. Thursday's memorial ceremony was held to remember foreigners, including Shaw, who are known to have been as devoted to Korea as the locals. And by remembering them, it helps us to acknowledge the debt we owe to these men who because they cherish peace, fought and died as warriors, sacrificing their own peace to ensure its continuation for others. It's not the first time a memorial like this has been held in the country, but this time the Korean government joined in to show its appreciation. Koreans will always remember the kindness and sacrifices made by the heroes who laid the groundwork for the country's independence, modernization and democracy. The scars of the Korean War haven't completely healed. The country remains divided and technically at war. But the legacy of soldiers like William Hamilton Shaw, who gave their lives to bring peace and prosperity to Korea, will endure. Na hyun Arirang News. And for the top international headlines, we connect now to Stephen Che at the News Center. The FIFA corruption scandal is dominated headlines across the globe, and the bad press has major sponsors worried. How will this crisis affect their relationship moving forward, Steve? FIFA's corporate sponsors have expressed obvious concerns over the arrests of senior officials accused of taking bribes and are speaking out against the ethical lapses. Nike released a statement saying they would fully cooperate with the authorities. Adidas said the organization should establish more transparency standards. Hyundai Motor said they were monitoring the situation closely. Now, with key sponsors laying down the pressure, it may affect the FIFA presidential election on Friday when incumbent Sepp Blatter goes up against Prince Ali bin Al Hussein. The crisis has cast a shadow on Blatter's leadership of the organization. But despite the coincidence of the timing of the charges, U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch said the FIFA Congress didn't play a role in the arrests of the 14 suspects, including seven high-ranking FIFA officials. 
these individuals through these organizations engaged in bribery to decide who would televise games, where the games would be held, and who would run the organization overseeing organized soccer worldwide, one of the most popular sports around the globe. Just like with past controversies, FIFA's corporate or closest corporate partners, excuse me, are sticking around. But FIFA, which usually has the upper hand, will have to undergo major change if they want to keep their business relationships intact. And moving on to Southeast Asia, the U.S. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter has urged China to halt construction on disputed islands in the South China Sea. Carter's comments come a day after China broke ground for two lighthouses being built on disputed territory and ahead of the annual Shangri-La Dialogue Security Conference in Singapore. We want a peaceful resolution of all disputes and an immediate and lasting halt to land reclamation by any claimant. We also oppose any further militarization of disputed features. He added the U.S. would heed calls by their allies to remain a defensive presence in the region. Beijing's foreign ministry shot back, accusing Washington of double standards and ulterior motives. They said construction was in line with their international responsibilities as a global superpower. And putting the grilling conflicts aside, McDonald's iconic Big Mac, along with all of their other burgers, will go through some big changes. The fast food giant facing slumping sales has decided to revamp their burgers with patties to be seared and grilled differently and buns toasted five seconds longer. CEO Steve Easterbrook said they're, quote, recommitting to hotter, tastier food as part of their new strategic plan launched earlier this month. Now, it's not the first time they've altered cooking methods. In the early 1990s, they scrapped toasters for speedy microwaves before quality issues forced them to change it back by 1997. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. Good night. So the mercury rising to 32.2 degrees Celsius this afternoon, a record for the season once again. And looking at the map, it wasn't only regions, other parts also saw record highs on their sunny skies and sweltering conditions. And tomorrow, the high in Seoul will be slightly lower, but still hovering above 30. And down south, especially Daegu will experience another scorcher, but there will be more clouds overhead across the nation. Uh, but that doesn't mean we'll be safe from the strong UV rays. The index will reach extremely high levels in Jeju-do, Jeolla-do, Chungcheong-do, and parts of Gangwon-do province. So if you're in those regions, try to avoid being outdoors in the afternoon and drink plenty of water to stay hydrated. On that note, let's take a closer look at the readings for tomorrow. Seoul will top out at 30, while Daegu and Gwangju will climb up to 33, and Busan will peak at 27 tomorrow afternoon. And as for the other regions, it seems like Daejeon will rise to 32, while Jeju and Tokdo both peak at 25 and 23, respectively. But thankfully, relief is on the way. Rain on Saturday will cool down things to the low 20s here in the capital, but it seems like temperatures will get hot again on Sunday. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world.
And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Huang Jihe. And I'm Paul Yi. Do join us at the same time tomorrow. Good night.